Peter is coming to us as the President and CEO of C Programs International, a U.S.-based nonprofit organization that provides vegetable seeds and support for nutrition and income support projects worldwide. Uh, his title this morning is Vegetable Gardening in Development and Relief, Selecting Seeds and Selecting Strategies, and our time is short this morning, so I don't want to take too much. Please welcome with me Mr. Peter Marks. Sound okay on my mic, or do I need to go over there? All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, since our time is short, uh, I decided to start with a couple jokes. Uh, since Danielle has this knack for telling jokes that can't be translated because they involve English wordplay, I dug deep in the crates to find farming related jokes which can be translated. Um, and they also have a message. So uh, here are two. <clears throat> One, how do you make a million dollars in farming? Start with two million. <laughs> two, <clears throat> uh, when is the best time to plant a tree? 10 years ago. All right, so I, I want to start with a couple personal notes. Uh, first of all, uh, please uh, raise your hand if you grew up on a farm or actively gardening with your parents, encouraging you to be out there digging in the dirt. And keep your hand up if you think that um, influenced the work you do today. That's about 100 hands. Uh, symbolically, to thank all of our parents, I want to thank mine. Please stand up. And a round of applause for all parents worldwide who keep their children connected to the land, uh, connected to uh, this great source of um, health and livelihood for, for all the world. So, so thank you for being here. Um, I also, uh, I know there are delegates from, I think, 25 plus countries, someone said earlier today, but also on a personal note, um, everyone here from Haiti, please stand up. And the reason I wanted to, wow, the reason I wanted to do this is uh, I flew home from Haiti a month ago today after visiting for the uh, first time, uh, and everybody there was, uh, gave me such a warm, and um, ceremonial welcome that I want to return the same to you. Thank you for traveling here. Thank you for the work you do in Haiti and for the information you're going to bring back. It's such a beautiful uh, country full of hope and good energy for the future. And I know you being here today um, will make a difference. So my personal thanks to you in exchange for the warm welcome I received while I was in Haiti. All right, so uh, why garden vegetables? And in this, uh, you'll notice with my photos, I put the country that it's taken from in the corner. These are all uh, projects done by our partners. Our organization kind of focuses on this conduit of seeds. We don't run programs. We don't really design programs other than um, providing the seeds and some distance support for the programming. And so my job a lot is to listen and learn and steal the great ideas and then share them back with you, and that's what I hope to do today. This program in Madagascar is one of my favorites. Uh, combines uh, literary, cent literacy centers for women um, with uh, teaching gardening. Uh, they use a keyhole garden strategy, like you can see on um, this woman's uh, right, and um, it's it's a great program there in Madagascar. Um, most large-scale hunger relief programs around the world focus on staple foods, on those starchy crops that fill bellies, and um, tend to ignore uh, the fresh garden vegetables, but that's what we focus on. <clears throat> uh, and so since you're a captive audience and you were stuck here in this plenary session, couldn't even choose to see my talk, I gotta show off my garden. Uh, so here is uh, my garden a month ago. Um, Oh, okay, I'm getting a uh, thumbs up that I can wander around. Thank you, guys. Um, 
So uh, in the back here is a bed of sweet non-bell peppers. Um, October 10th, about a week or 10 days later, there was a hard frost and I didn't have those peppers anymore. I'm gonna tell the story of those peppers, just to make a point or two. So we started 13 plants, four varieties inside on March 25th. I love these sweet, these are not hot spicy peppers. I like these sweet non-bell peppers. I think they're a lot easier to grow than bell peppers and get a good crop. Um, whoops. Uh, planted out the peppers about May 20th. About 11 of them survive a windstorm. Uh, we only eat them ripe. We get our first ripe peppers on July 20th. This was our first crop. Uh, this is the rest of July, the beginning of the harvest. There's the first six days of August. The peppers are starting to come in. There's the harvest on August 9th. There's the rest of August. We're drowning in peppers from 10 plants. Uh, there's September and October. Uh, now been harvesting peppers for almost uh, 90 days by the end of it. Uh, I, I weighed each harvest. Uh, for this experiment, and the total was 46 pounds from 11 plants. Uh, there's a very light amount of non-edible matter, conservatively about 90% edible by weight. Uh, if you calculate this out, about 400 grams of uh, ripe peppers contain the recommended daily intake of vitamin A for a pregnant woman to maintain health and avoid birth defects. For the 40 days of harvest of this tiny crop that you understand you know, was an area of dirt the size of a conference table, essentially, um, it would provide almost all of the, the required vitamin A for a pregnant woman with no other vitamin A in her diet. Um, per 100 grams of peppers, it would also have these other nutrients that you see here. 212% uh, of your daily vitamin C, 12% of your folate, et cetera, over 30 different members of the carotenoid nutrient family. Now, why do I tell you this? other than to show off my garden, which is something that every gardener loves to do. Um, this is not the point I'm making. Uh, I, I really don't believe in miracle foods. I, I don't like the concept. Um, there's, hey, I heard an amen. Uh, uh, I don't think everyone should grow peppers, no. Um, but uh, I tell the story of this one small crop because they're commonplace. They're something a lot of people can try in a lot of climates. And in one tiny garden anywhere in the world, they might work miracles. Or they might not. Two years ago, I had no pepper harvest. Uh, the brown marmorated stink bugs came and sucked all the juice out of them, exactly as the flowers were setting fruit that year. I didn't get any. Fortunately, in a vegetable garden, there are 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 other plants that you grow, that magic word, agrobiodiversity. So I started with that question, why vegetable gardening? Why is that such an important strategy for all of us? It's because in that diversification of cropping strategies, you might get that one miracle. And it might be a different one every year in every place. Annual garden vegetables readily grown in a mixed multitude of species and varieties. A good strategy, always. This spreads risk, decreases the impact of a single crop failure. As I said, increases the chance of miraculous results from one or more crops. They're readily grown in small plots close to your home. <clears throat> uh, fit very well uh, with work uh, by women in many cultures, not all but women are often carrying water to the house anyway. They're often the primary preservers and preparers of food. Um, and so in the hands of women, as they say in the microenterprise field, uh, the whole family is likely to benefit from both nutrition and income harvested from the garden. Uh, especially in crisis situations and extreme poverty, I'm sure you're all familiar, men often travel away from the home to seek income elsewhere. Um, and the small kitchen garden is a great fit when that's happening, a great way to reduce risk. Hey, here's a picture from Haiti. Uh, this is a school garden in Haiti. And so is that. Uh, many are very quick to harvest. The bok choy in this picture um, 
it's going to be ready to eat in, I don't know, 30, 40 days when people are really hungry. I heard on my trip to Haiti, they're picking them in 14 to 21 days, which is not ideal. But when people are really hungry, that's what they're doing. And by the way, I forgot to do something. Sorry, cameraman. I have some seed for everybody. So uh, we can pass this around. Take one if you have a place to plant it. This is uh, a packet of bok choy, like in this picture. And then there's a carrot. Um, the carrot is Kuroda, which is a subtropical, open-pollinated uh, variety that we have really good luck with. So take one if you have a place to grow it and pass it on. I'm sorry, I might not have one for everybody. Hunger has an annual rhythm in many places, and a capable grower can make choices and manipulate the seasons with, agri with annual vegetables in a way they can't with a tree crop or a perennial crop. I love permaculture gardening as much as the next person, but one factor of it compared to the annual vegetable garden is the annual vegetable garden, you can manipulate the harvest time a little easier. Finally, as a perishable specialty crop, they're quite readily sold in local markets at a price fair to the buyer and seller. You know, when you're growing your maize in Zambia and your 1,000 neighbors are too, you're pretty dependent on market-based pricing forces. When you're growing a variety of fresh market vegetables, you're a little less dependent. Um, that income buys school fees, medicines, home improvements, livestock, etc. Now, why not work with annual garden vegetables? So uh, always ask yourself in the community, why aren't these crops already in production? You know, a lot of these solutions sound really simple. Uh, help people start a garden, of course. And we were started, you know, our organization with this simple idea, and sometimes it is simple. Um, there are 75 countries around the world where we've had partners grow seed that we provided. But mostly, it's not so simple. So I want to get into a concept here, which is a really basic, I, I didn't go to school for this, but I'm guessing that if you took International Studies 101, you might learn this concept. So I'm sorry to be tedious for those of you who did. But I find it really helpful, and to apply it to seeds, I find it really helpful that um, in any development work, and including a seed system, there are three kind of poles to think about, availability, access, and utilization. And we often mistake one for the other. So uh, people aren't eating healthy. I'm going to bring them seeds. Well, is the issue that seeds are not available in their community? Maybe not. There might be another issue that I'll get into. It might be an access issue. Can all people access quality seed? And from where? Is it from traders? Is it from shops? Is it from dealers? Is it from aid? that's already there? Is it from seed saving and the informal farmer, farmer sector? And when we have partner, partners who, who approach us, and if after this conference you approach us and say, hey, we want to get some seed from you, um, that's the first question we ask. Well, well, have you done an assessment of can people reach seed in the community already? And if not, if it's there but they can't access it, what's the reason? Is it geography and transport? Do the roads to get to town look like this? And that might be the only issue. Uh, is it affordability? Uh, increasingly, as a development strategy, NGOs are giving out cash instead of materials when the issue is affordability, not availability. So think about that. Um, you're supporting the local economy if you overcome the affordability gap by helping assist with a local purchase, whereas if you just provide the material, you're potentially hurting the local economy. And this is a criticism of our own program um, and a, a, a reason for you to be cautious in any situation where you're giving out materials. Uh, is there something about discrimination or power structures when it comes to access? Sometimes that's just around gender. Do women know that the, the fruits of their labor are not going to benefit the household in that particular culture? Here are two examples of helping with access as opposed to availability. Uh, our partners in Guatemala realized there was an access issue in their little town of Chajul. And um, they ordered diverse vegetable seed from a source within Guatemala 
made it available in their local ferreteria there in Chahul, um, which is the hardware store, basically. Uh, they subsidized the price. So they did an assessment of the community, went around, um, made a ledger for the store owner saying these 100 families and widows qualify for a seed subsidy at this percentage. And then the people were able to go in, get the seed, pay what they can, can afford, kind of like our food stamp program in the US. And just like that, the store owner then got reimbursed by the NGO for the difference between the price they should be getting and the price that the families were able to pay. So um, access was overcome. Uh, maybe instead of spending $200 to ship seeds from the US, give Eddie the entrepreneur a microloan for his motorbike gas so that he can go to the big capital city where the seed is sold and bring seed back to the community. Another program approach that's a little different than just giving stuff away. And uh, you could also get Eddie a helmet while you're at it. <laughs> Three, utilization. Do people know how to grow the vegetables in question? Store them, sell them, cook them. Do they like to eat them? Do they understand the nutritional benefits? So this is what ECHO is so good at and what you all are so good at and why you're here is to help people with this <laughs> utilization issue. But I think we still all make the error because we love a fresh tomato or a fresh mango or the taste of moringa or whatever it is that we love that we think if we can just give someone the seed and the support to grow it, that they'll automatically want to eat it or sell it or cook it or store it. Uh, if people don't have the knowledge or interest to utilize a crop, handing them the seed fertilizer tool technique to grow the crop does nothing to change that, right? So there's a, this is a non-equation. <laughs> Availability plus access does not equal utilization in every case. Who has seen that in their work? Yes, that you've gone through a lot of hard work to get somebody to produce or accomplish something, and then it wasn't utilized. Let me see those hands again. Yeah, it's a good number. So um, think about this with seed and everything. Um, there are a couple, uh, I'm gonna give you a web link, which is uh, seedsystem.org, and that um, is put together by a brilliant woman at Catholic Relief Services named Louise Sperling. Um, and there's a couple papers that I wrote with her about vegetable seed that kind of are the basis of this talk um, and that, that I sent to Tim and led to me being here today. Um, and this is from one of those papers. It's kind of long to read, um, but essentially the yellow parts. Uh, to grow, harvest, prepare, and taste new foods is an energy-consuming experiment for families in poverty or crisis and may not happen automatically even when people face hunger or malnutrition. And then it goes through a lot of what I just said and said, and, and it concludes for all these reasons, a focus on nutrition training is key to any vegetable growing program. Here's a little story. Um, one of the sets of people we like to work with are Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, Zambia suffered a series of crippling droughts from 2011 to 2014. Peace Corps volunteer Casey Hooten told us the people in her village were subsisting on tree leaves and caterpillars potentially good food sources, but not necessarily the favorites um, of the population. Now Casey reports this, and this was such a su succinct statement from her of um, a complete program that addresses availability, access, and utilization that I just wanted to quote her. To date, I have helped 137 households implement and sustain 137 gardens. My policy for the seed donation was that they attend one meeting on creating and maintaining a healthy garden, soil composition and components, water access, weeding, et cetera, a meeting on food security, nutrition, and seed saving, and then lastly, that I would help them create the garden as well as provide monthly check-ins. The results have been phenomenal. Each of these households has become more food secure, has variety in their diet, are cooking new dishes with recipes I provided, and are planning on how they can expand with the next rainy season. How's my time? You're All right, thank you, sir. So a great example. I'm now gonna shift gears a little bit and um, uh, share a, a couple ideas uh, 
In tropical climates, getting past the germination and seedling stage can be the most difficult. So, you know, not everybody does everything. I, I, I think about this culture. I, you might not be good at changing your oil. There's someone else in your community who is, and that person you go to and change your oil. You know, and kind of often in development work, we assume that everybody needs to be equally good at everything. And I, I, I don't think that's true. And can, in a vegetable gardening program, one thing we've seen a lot of success with is there being a centralized effort to produce things to the seedling stage. And then the distribution of seedlings instead of seeds. Um, and often uh, uh, in areas with, uh, you know, people plant vegetables during the rainy season, but there's too much rain. Um, or there's really heavy insect pressure during that season and disease pressure. A raised nursery bed like this one in Liberia is a technique that we've seen several of our smartest partners use. Um, and so have some great pictures of the construction of one from uh, this program in Liberia. I want to talk now about selecting seeds. And I'm going to start with some basic characteristics and then move at the end of my talk to getting down and dirty about specific recommendations for vegetable varieties and that sort of thing. So first of all, we have a, a strong belief in small packets. Um, and uh, it avoids waste. And part of the reason I say that is the quantity of vegetable seeds needed to grow a home garden is so very small. You know, it's, it's measured in grams or less if it's something like amaranth. And what you see, you know, the seed most often sold in the developing world is in these cans. And um, there's a couple issues with that. Uh, one is too much tends to be given out to each person if you don't have someone with that awareness of, of uh, and, and then you end up with, with a wasted amount. Second, more opportunity for fraud of some kind. And this is common, and I hear this all the time, you know, the way seed is sold people take these nice looking cans of professional high quality seed and they either mix in or replace it with a seed that's not going to grow. Um, and people are used to doing that and by getting seed in small packets like Echo does, um, you're, you're preventing that. Um, also allows you to put planting instructions right on the packet. First choice graphically, our packets that are passing around have some little graphics on them which might or might not help everybody. Second choice in local languages. Uh, seed packets or containers labeled with a price in a foreign currency are more likely to be redirected away from the targeted use. Uh, don't rely on those dates. We print our packets with a range of three years <laughs> um, on, during which they might or might not be viable. The information on a seed packet is not a promise once you get it out into conditions. Um, I did the seed bank tour yesterday here at ECHO, which was wonderful. Um, and uh, the point they made is the old maxim that uh, humidity plus temperature should not add up to more than 100 using Fahrenheit temperature. Um, those of you who live in tropical areas would find that statistic laughable. Um, and uh, because humidity plus temperature is more than 100 uh, every day of the year. Um, we, we ship our seeds in a, a sealed plastic set of 100 like I was passing around in a poly sleeve, and we counsel our partners to dig a pit, um, uh, sort of to where the soil keeps the, the, the temperature level constant, and stick the seeds down there until the planting season for the vegetable. Uh, why did I get into that? I know. Um, the dates, the, the, the use-by dates that are printed on a, on a packet are, are just not going to hold in those conditions. So do your own germination tests. And there's great resources in ECHO materials about how to do that. Um, seek trusted local and regional sources. Increasingly, as commerce spreads around the world, you don't need an organization like us. Um, here are two examples. And actually, uh, one of these is um, a subset of the other. This is a company called East West Seed. It has Dutch roots, but kind of grew up in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's doing a fantastic job providing vegetable seed in individual home garden uh, packets for tropical areas and has really boosted up their African distribution network in recent years. Um, this company called Victoria Seeds, uh, which is in Uganda, is, distributes the east-west line as well as other vegetable seeds in Uganda. The last couple calls I've gotten from Uganda, I've referred them there, and that was my whole job and I was done. Um, and so there's more and more of, of this kind of thing happening. 
Um, and so uh, look around and uh, see what you can find. This is going to be review for most of you in the room, but for those of you for who it's not, I know there's a lot of confusion um, on these issues. Uh, open pollinated seed versus hybrid seed versus GMO seed, et cetera. Uh, open pollinated is inbred seed, and I apologize to the agronomists in the room. I'm probably going to say this in a layman's sort of way that isn't technically exactly right. It's selectively or repeatedly inbred to have a fairly uniform genotype so that you can save seed with it, but only if it's only crossed with itself. And there's too many training materials and advice materials out there that make it sound like if you plant an open pollinated seed and you harvest the seed, it will come true to the parents, period. Well, it will not come true to the parents if it was a melon or squash and there was another melon or squash within three miles or uh, one in the same species that grows wild and, and those cross. So yes, you can save seed from open pollinated vegetables, but it's not automatic that you're going to have the predictable result. Heirloom is a non-technical term simply describing a seed variety as being handed down through the generations. Hybrid is seed bred by an intentional cross of two specific parents to achieve a desired set of traits like Mendel did with the sweet peas. The first generation when you plant it is going to have extremely predictable results. The second generation when you save seed from that is going to have widely divergent results, may or may not grow an edible crop, um, and that is why people say you can't save seed from hybrid crops. The truth is, in developing countries, many people do. <laughs> and um, sometimes they have decent results. Um, so that's an interesting sub-point. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, I want to talk about a land race. Um, the traditional way of saving seed is by maintaining wide genetic diversity in a single crop in your field. None of the seed types described in the last two slides do this. They're all bred down to narrow diversity to get it into a packet so that it's a saleable item with predictable results of some kind. But traditionally, for thousands of years, the way humans have done it is that in one field, you would have some that yield highest in an ideal year, some that yield a little better in a drought year, some that yield a little better in an overly wet year, some that, that make some food for you when the locusts come. And you have all this diversity in your field, and you save from the whole field, and you save from two years ago and three years ago, in case this year is that terrible year. Um, and it's a risk management strategy. And you will almost never find this in a seed packet. But uh, it's an important kind of understanding gap bet between how we think about seed and how people have traditionally thought about seed. And it's an important concept to understand. I'm not going to talk as much as I usually would about choosing specific vegetables uh, because here you are at the ECHO conference, and there are fantastic resources on this. Here are two different items from Dr. Uh, Frank Martin. Um, I haven't been associated with ECHO closely enough to have ever met him, but I love his writing. One is in the wonderful book, Agricultural Options for the Poor, which you can buy in the um, ECHO uh, bookstore uh, or is online. And the other one, you can Google and retrieve a PDF. It's called Selecting the Best Plants for the Tropical Subsistence Farm. If you take anything out of this talk and have it be nothing I said, and to go read um, Dr. Martin's charts, there are great, uh, and, and um, resources, uh, there are great charts like this. For each set, this is uh, tropical fruit vegetables, he calls them. Um, and uh, he goes through, what is this, nine different ways that that crop can get utilized food, feed, fiber, construction, fuel, soil amendment, erosion control, and modify climate, and rates them for each one. So amazing resource. They're the same kind of chart for leafy vegetables, for legumes, for, for everything. Uh, the one poll of analysis that he doesn't cover in these charts, because he's an agronomist, uh, is, is commercial value. And often that's number one or two right up there with food. So when you make your own chart and your own analysis and you're asking people in your community where you work, what crops do we want to try, add, what can we sell to, to this analysis? And, and then you'll have a complete picture. 
Uh, locally available does not always mean locally adapted, especially for vegetables. It, it, this tends to be true for the staple cereal crops. There's minute local ad adapt adaptability for things like sorghum and maize and so on. Um, but when you get into vegetable seed, the supply chains are incredibly narrow. Uh, take carrots. In the United States, 90% of carrot seed is grown in two counties in central Oregon. And worldwide, there's an area in France and an area in New Zealand and that area in Oregon. And probably those three areas, which are probably all about equal size and probably each consist of about 10 different farms, probably grow 90% of the commercially available carrot seed in the world, whether you're buying it in Africa, Asia, the United States, Florida, or New York. And that's how vegetable seed is. It has very narrow supply chains. And so there's, uh, there, there tends to be a great buy local ethic among us, but you can be fooled. Um, locally sold, yes, that's a nice thing. You support a local vendor, but there can be very random reasons why Detroit dark red beets are available in every you know, vegetable seed selection in the world. It's not because they're the best adapted beet everywhere in the world. And so um, think beyond what's local. Don't bring what you love from your own garden without further research. Um, and uh, day length in onions is a classic example. If you have a wonderful onion you love to grow in Illinois, uh, that onion needs uh, 14 to 16 hour days to start forming big, nice, full size bulbs. If you're in Fort Myers, Florida, the longest day of the year is probably about 13 and a half hours. And even more, more tropical than that, it's even shorter. Your onions are never going to bulb up, your, your long day onions. Uh, those are an extreme example. Other vegetables also have day length set sensitivity uh, to a lesser degree. Here are a few tips. Uh, tomatoes, we like processing types. We call them in the US and in the seed trade. Uh, they're most reliable, most disease resistant. Carrots, um, we like commercial hybrids. Uh, and because uh, carrots are a biennial, except for this one variety, Uberlandia, and then a couple other varieties bred in India, Uberlandia, by the way, you can get from the Echo Seed Bank, and it goes to seed in the first year, but otherwise, Carrots need a vernalization period. They need to get cold, and then the second year they put up a seed head and you save seed. So carrots are well loved all over the world, but you can't save seed from them anyway. So um, there are amazingly heat resistant and disease resistant carrots, like the beautiful ones in this picture from Central African Republic that came from our seed, um, that you can grow in the tropics, but you can't save seed from them. Uh, cabbage. Widely grown, uh, Copenhagen Market is a, commercially, a commonly available open pollinated with good heat tolerance that we recommend and use. Uh, Echo has a great collection of uh, Moschata species pumpkins. Um, this is the one species of squash that I recommend for, for the tropics. Uh, cow peas. Okra. Uh, there's an okra that's really commonly available that our partners have had wonderful success with called Long Pod Green. Uh, it's a short, fast plant. Uh, cucumber has a somewhat low nutrient value, but high market value in a lot of places. What we call pickling types um, often are uh, highly productive and good choices for the home kitchen garden. Uh, beets and chard, some interesting things I've learned about regional preferences. But when you get south of the equator to Madagascar, et cetera, you'll see a lot of people growing beets and, um, and so on. Uh, keep in mind with certain items, uh, they have different, very different types. Uh, the uh, eggplants uh, in Africa and Asia are actually different species than those that we grow in American home gardens, continuing that theme. Uh, if you grow kale uh, in the United States, it's probably not taller than your head. Um, but what they call sukumawiki, stretch the weeks, in Kenya and East Africa. Um, this is a tree kale, or tree collards they call it, and that's what it looks like. Um, greens, I think, among all the vegetable types are going to be the most, um, give you the highest caution to ask what people grow locally, because there are going to be uh, great traditions in, in that area. Here's a cornucopia of tropical leafy greens from that article by Dr. Martin.
most or many of which are offered in the Echo Seed Bank. In our work, though, even though you do have these great foodways, food traditions all over the world, uh, we find that people are so often displaced from their land, um, riddled by conflict, by generations of poverty, by climate change, that whatever those historic cultural foodways were, they're lost. You know, there's, there's, there's little there that you can sort of honor and go back to and point back to. So people often um, are striving to build new traditions. And the history of vegetables um, is tremendous that way. You know, peppers, which are loved all over the world, are an American crop. And melons, which are loved all over the world, are an African crop. Um, and carrots, which are loved all over the world, originated in Central Asia, Afghanistan. And um, so trade has a long history in vegetables, so don't, don't be scared about um, sharing and experimenting while also maintaining that cultural respect um, that we all know is so important. How much time do I have left? Uh, you've got 10 minutes. I've got 10 minutes. And so I'd like to take questions and discussion. Uh, should I bring out a mic? Is that the best way to do it? Do we have a mobile mic? Then everyone can hear the questions. The question is uh, storing seeds. Can we store them in a refrigerator or in a freezer? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question is storing seeds. Um, I hesitate to answer that because um, is Holly here? All right. Uh, let's uh, go ahead. OK. The Echo staff are giving me the go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, most uh, seed types you can store in the refrigerator or freezer. Um, one caution uh, which came up on the tour yesterday, which is a really good one, um, I like to save seed. Uh, I like to keep it in the freezer. Um, you take the jar out, and then you let it sit on your, at, at room temperature, outdoor temperature, um, for half a day until you cannot feel any temperature difference between um, what's uh, the, the jar and the outside air. Other, if you take it out of the freezer, open it right away, all of the moisture in the room goes and condenses right onto those seeds immediately. Um, but the other, there's a really good appropriate technology tip um, uh, in the Echo materials for a, uh, uh, basically turning around the valve on a bicycle pump and um, taking a canning jar and essentially storing seeds in a vacuum. Wonderful tip. So take a look at that. And then remember my tip about putting them in something waterproof and putting them underground where the, where the temperature is stable. Other than that, keep doing germination testing. Again, there's great echo materials on that, but it's way simpler than most people think. Generally, you take a paper towel, put 20 or 100 seeds on it, count them, spray them with water, keep them moist, and, and see what percent sprout in three to four days. May I add something, Peter? Yes, please. So, Regarding the vacuum sealing, you can do that with a jar. Uh, buying a vacuum sealing gadget is not a bad investment. Uh, you can get the cheaper ones from Walmart for like $100. Those aren't going to be great for large scale sealing, but for your home or small project use, that's great. You can, uh, when you vacuum seal, you can even leave these on the shelf, although it's better to refrigerate, as, as was uh, mentioned. So, uh, but if you've got a bigger project, you might look at a larger investment in some of these more somewhat industrial vacuum sealers as well. The, the trick is to get the seed dry enough to store in the first place when you're in the humid tropics. That's the hard thing. And if you get a chance, they have a, a, a light bulb and fan-based seed drying cabinet here. You can also use like a gas-operated leaf blower with the screen on the end. Um, uh, and then uh, I saw a really cool trick yesterday. I was in, there's this company called Ag Innovations, which I notice and remember because the, the salesman from it is named Peter Marks. Um, and they make a, like, a, a high-tech ceramic bead product um, that absorbs uh, moisture. And then you can just put it back out in the sun. It'll dry out again. It'll absorb moisture again. I thought that was pretty cool until yesterday I did the seed bank thing, and they just had rice. Uh, which you can also roast, put in a jar with your seed, 
and the demonstration that Holly and Tim were showing off yesterday, it was 24% humidity inside um, the jar, the sealed canning jar with the rice and the seeds, and 45% humidity out in, in, in the seed lab. Um, and uh, what a wonderful, easy, simple technology that completely dry rice was just hungry to soak up the moisture in the air, and it, its volume was much greater than the amount of seed in the jar. Another question. Yeah, I'll try to yell. Oh, thank you. Yeah, in our country in Central African Republic, we can get vegetable seeds in cans, and I believe they are vacuum sealed inside. And I was told that they can last up to 25 years in cans. And I'm just wondering if uh, your program would consider switching into cans and s helping with the, you know, the storage life of the seeds. Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, and the short answer is not right now. Uh, you know, we just try to keep it cheap. Um, uh, once we get into something like that, then you know, these emerging commercial companies can do it better than we can, I'd say. And we'd rather support them by sending traffic their way. You know, we see our program as a short-term strategy to catalyze more vegetable growing, essentially. Get seed out there. Um, let me just touch on how we're different from Echo Seed Bank program, because we com inhabit a completely different niche um, and can work together and refer to each other. Um, Echo specializes in these underutilized vegetables, uh, crops. We really specialize in what you might call the overutilized vegetable crops, the 20 to 30 most common in, in, in global commerce um, among the annual garden vegetables. Our minimum order is uh, 100 packets of any one variety, um, and we'll typically ship in a carton of about 1,500 to 2,000 packets, and we get seed onto pallets um, when we move them into large situations. Um, and so, uh, and you know, we, we try to make it affordable. So uh, the, the, the price ranges from 12 to 25 cents a packet, uh, depending on the volume that, that you're bringing in. Uh, but what I was starting to say is, we know that shipping seed from the US as sort of a relief or aid mechanism is a short-term solution. It's not sustainable. And so I think our model is we're working with people like you who want there to be an easily deployable sort of turnkey way to put a spark plug under annual vegetable gardening in their community on a large scale. And then we work with them to figure out an exit strategy. Is there that seed company in the capital city where you can buy the cans now that you have enough people excited on the market side to be able to afford them um, programmatically? Maybe they even chip into the cost at that point. Or Eddie the entrepreneur becomes the seed salesman, not just the transport. Um, and uh, you have a little um, supply chain set up in the village, or maybe it's people saving seed. Um, uh, I would only comment that for every 10 partners we have that are really excited about seed saving programs, it seems like one or two or three out of those 10 come back and say, yeah, that was really successful. And seven or eight say, that was a lot harder for people to make work than I thought it would be. Um, and so I like the exit strategies that involve people connecting to seed and commerce, almost better than I like the seed saving strategies for vegetables. Um, and I worked for many years with farmers in the US. They didn't really save seed. You know, there were the, the cost benefit equation there, it was easier for them to pay a little money for the seed to the supplier every year than it was for them to get the results they would get from saving vegetable seed themselves, given the labor involved. So, um, so again, like with the oil change, I try to apply that same thinking. Where are we going? You know, in Liberia. Uh, I think it's toward people being able to buy seed in a place convenient to them in their community and save it too if they want to, but. Um, Peter, Peter, yes. we have a question over here. All right, last question probably time-wise. Well, I think it's a really important part of the, the annual vegetables are so in, important and uh, in, the, in the libraries now in, in the United States, we have a seed saving. Uh, you, so you can go to Basalt Library and we started uh, where you can actually save the local seeds and check them out like you would a book. And that's going across the United States. And then what you're doing and what a lot of other people are doing, in addition to perennial vegetables and, and to the underutilized vegetables, this is a really important part. Those peppers that you were eating, you can just scrape the seeds off 
save those, give them to your neighbors and your, or, or, so the, the, the seeds are so important in the tomatoes and the, and the, I have five greenhouses. One is tropical, one is Mediterranean, and three are for annuals. So, you know, in Colorado I can grow citrus, bananas um, in one greenhouse, figs in another greenhouse, but I have three greenhouses that are specific just for annuals. And then I turn those into nursery greenhouses during the off season. And I've just got a, a new book out called Forest Garden Greenhouse. I'll be talking tomorrow at 1.30. But this is a really important, inspiring talk that you just gave in, for annual vegetables. We forget about that. And it's a big part of what we can eat throughout the year. Thank you, yes. And I'll just close by saying uh, I, I'm the, the Meet the Speaker session uh, that I'll be at is 1.30 today. I'm going to duck out with my parents uh, for a lot of this morning, so if you're looking for me, I probably, you probably won't find me. But I'd love to meet as many of you as possible in person. Um, I have copies of our seed catalog to share. Uh, and so uh, come on by, and I'd love to, to talk more. And thank you for this time.